because my poor AVX mount is ill and in hospital at Celestron. Ooh. Let's hope they sort it out fairly quickly. Well, I hope so, but I'm, I'm hoping they got somebody working on it. <laughs> yeah. We've got some speakers lined up. So we've got uh, Steve for Thursday. Hold on, somebody else coming in. Uh, we've got Steve on Thursday talking about binoculars. Hello, what's happening here? Uh, then we've got John Spencer on the 7th of April, was one of the uh, team who worked on New Horizons, exploring, exploring Arakoth. So he's hopefully going to give us some inside information on all that. And then 14th of April, we've got Terry Lovejoy. He hasn't given me a title yet, but hopefully he's going to be talking about comets because obviously those who know Terry Lovejoy and you've probably heard of Comet Lovejoy in its various forms because he's discovered quite a few in his time. So looking forward to that. And I think he'll probably burst our bubble on Comet Atlas. It's not going to probably, according to him, it's not going to perform as well as we think it might do. And I've also got Space Station guys. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, actually. Are you in? He said he was going to come in tonight. Well, we haven't actually got a date from him, but he's going to talk about ISS imaging. I don't know if you've seen his stuff online, and there's been quite a few people imaging the ISS lately as well, which has been quite good. Unmute you. And then I'll stop sharing. And then, Sean, if you want to uh, share your presentation. Okay, Sean, I can't hear you at the moment. All right. Okay. All right. Okay, well. Hello, and uh, thanks everybody to come and have a listen. Uh, I'll just talk about a little bit about Milky Way. Um, and what I've been doing over the last 10 years is a lot of deep sky, uh, which I love doing. But there's a lot of paraphernalia involved in doing it, and a lot of setup, cable, and all the rest of it. And I've spent hours and hours uh, doing it. And I was kind of missing out on looking up at the sky at the same time. So um, I thought I'd have a go at capturing the Milky Way, but just do it simply. You know, in other words, with a camera and a tripod, no tracking, nothing complicated, just to go out and see what I can do. Um, so I'll just give you an idea of uh, the planning and the process and some of the camera settings and uh, things like that um, that I used and, and uh, to get me where I've got with it now. Um, so I'll just uh, I'll start with the obvious things, um, and that is um, the Milky Way itself. Using the planetarium, everybody knows about using them. Um, it sounds obvious, but the Milky Way comes up at different times, at different times of the year. And I, and I was quite interested in getting down to Sagittarius and seeing that sort of structure of Cygnus. So, um, you know, using the planetarium is, is a great guide from wherever you want to go, um, whether it be uh, at home or, you know, abroad or anywhere in the country, um, to see what the sky is like from that point and at that point in time. Of course, you can run it forward and see, you know, what time the Milky Way comes up. Um, so that helps you plan for your, you know, for what you want to get um, and what sort of landscape. If you're interested in landscapes as well, you might want to get something, you know, the Milky Way positioned around something. So the planetarium there is uh, is a very um, vital tool for planning that operation. Um, this one's Stellarium. I mean, there's others, of course, but uh, Stellarium does the job very well. Um, the other thing I use um, is, uh, well, this one's TPE for Android. Um, and that's very useful. That gives you... Uh, the angles of the sun and the moonrise. Um, it gives you astronomical darkness each day and all the rest of it. And you can place that anywhere in the world at any time as well and get a representation of um, where you're looking. Now, I don't know, um, you know, you probably won't be able to see it on the screen, but um, you've got, um, if I show you this slide, it gives you an idea. You can sort of, uh, you can put it down somewhere and it gives you a photographic, you know, um, GPS re representation of the area where you want to go to. Say, for instance, like there's a picture on here of Durdle Door. Um, I want to get the angle and what time darkness and, and then use that with the planetarium to plan exactly how I want to line up and where I want to get to. Um, and those two things are very useful. Uh, TPE, I think it was a few quid on, on Android, but there are others. Um, but of course, planetariums are free. So um, there's not too much uh, cost involved in that. Um, and that's a vital thing to help you plan because, as I said, I want to do it with a camera and a tripod. So to get there and do it, you've got to be as quick as possible with the rotation of the Earth, obviously. Um, so you want everything. You want to know all uh, what you're going into. You want to plan it all like a military operation. So when you get there, you can get the thing going, especially if you're doing a panoramic. You need to do it as quickly as possible. Um, so those two things are very, very useful. Um, 
which brings me on to the other bit of equipment, which is uh, where a bit more money's involved, which is, of course, the camera. Um, that's a camera I used to have, a 1000D. At the moment, I've got a 6D, and that's one of the cheapest full-frame cameras you can get. And it's superb for catching uh, the Milky Way. Very, very good. Um, but this is this is the sort of thing I'm using, just a basic uh, uh, camera. A Canon uh, 6D is my choice. Some of the sort of newer um, uh, cameras are superb, like the 7D and, and others that have come since then. They're so good at handling noise, even though they're a crop chip, they're very, very good. But the 6D, being a 20 megapixel, I mean, the pixels are big, so there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of light gathering power in each pixel. So they tend to, you know, absorb a lot of light. Um, also, that lets through a little bit of the um, hydrogen alpha. That's, that's a little bit of a pass through there. Um, but there's, uh, there's things to consider. Um, and one of the things is all the sizes of the chips on each of the camera makes and what have you. Um, you've got the medium format, which I don't do. Then you've got the 35 mil full frame, which is what the old 35 mil film cameras used to have. That was their frame. That's why they call it full frame. That's the size of my chip, the 35 mil. Um, the other one is the APS uh, Canon and the APS-C, which is the Nikon. And they're showing you a different representation of each um, it, size of the chip. So, you know, the bigger the chip, the better in the sense that you can um, make a longer exposure, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and to put that in a visual, um, if you look at that one, that shows you the different sort of focal lengths on an, an APS-C crop chip and a full frame. So you can see the, uh, the 14 mil on a full frame would give you like, you know, the maximum exposure you could roughly do would be about 30 seconds. But of course, on a, you'd need an 8 mil on an APS-C to get the same field of view and so on and so forth. As you can see, when it goes right down to the bottom, um, I use a 50 mil sometimes on a full frame, which I'll show at the end. Um, and you can do 10 seconds. That's about the, the amount you can do. But you'd need a 35 mil on a crop chip. So uh, it's all, you know, uh, and this is all to do with static tripod kind of work, not so much with... Uh, with tracking or anything like that. Um, so that's the thing to bear in mind when you're doing that. Um, the other thing, I mean, the lenses, I mean, really, you, you know, as good as you can get, uh, um, I've got some prime lenses and uh, this chart just shows you a few of the lenses and their light gathering untracked um, rating that says on the right hand side. And basically that's a multiplication of a few things in there um, to show you the actual um, light gathering ability of each lens. If you look at the, the best one is the 24 mm f1.4. Now I use that lens and it's superb. And the higher the number, the better light gathering power because the, the more light it will get in because of the focal length, the aperture and all the rest of it, the, uh, the amount of exposure time you can do with that maximum. Um, so uh, and that's, that happens to be the best one. In fact, I have to stop that down. I've tried that at f1.4 and it is just almost too overexposed. So I sort of shoot at about f2, f2.8 on that, which is perfectly all right. Okay, um, moving on to, because uh, I'd like to sort of, uh, you know, talk a little bit about the settings. As I say, how I do it, as you said, Dave, you know, it's not just about the picture, this is it, and I did that. It's about how to do it. And it, it you know, it's a basic idea, it's a basic method. I know some of you people obviously know these things, so I'm not, you know, talking down, but I'm just uh, giving you an idea of um, some of the settings, because when you're out there, you want to get it done as quickly as possible, as I said. So you, you want to know this sort of thing um, as a rule of thumb. Um, so, you know, the first thing is fairly obvious to most people, I think, is shooting in RAW, because shooting in RAW, um, keep, you keep the whole, uh, you keep all the detail, all the information you, you take, you keep. Um, it, it doesn't do any sort of processing for you, and you can obviously change the colour balance afterwards and what have you, because I tend to shoot in, um, you know, all white balance, um, and then when I get home and, you know, do nighttime stuff, I, I can change that down to about 4,000 ISO. Because that's round about where you want to be um, for the nighttime Milky Way with the DSLR. They're in that 3900 4000. Okay, but you can change that obviously when you're shooting in RAW, you can change the exposure and everything. Um, the shutter speed um, is the old rule of 500, and basically what that means is, as I'm sure probably a lot of you know, um, that you divide the lens you've got um, into 500, and that will give you, as a rule of thumb, the maximum exposure time that you can achieve um, with a static camera before they start to streak the stars. Um, and as I said, I've got a full frame camera. So if I use a 50 mil you know, lens and I divide it into 500, of course that gives me 10 seconds. If you've got a crop chip um, like the Canons, that's a 1.6. 
So you then got to divide that by 1.6 and so on, because it's all about the rotation and uh, trying to achieve as long an exposure as you can without showing that you know streaking stuff. And that's all about light gathering, time of exposure. It's about getting as much light as you can within that chip, you know, that, that you can do with, with a static camera. Because um, obviously, as I say, I, I do some of this stuff's a public talk, so you have to forgive me for this, but. Um, obviously, we rotate and we've got the angle, so that's why we're doing it, um, because of the rotation of the Earth. I mean, it's a huge... You realise when you start using a static camera quite, and, and um, a lens quite how quickly that does start to streak. So the Rural 500 is um, a general thing that um, will help to... Uh, I mean, you can experiment with all this sort of thing. I mean, 20 seconds is a... With a 24mm lens, as I said, that lens I've got on a full chip, I do 20 seconds um, as a rule of, you know, the rule of thumb 500 rule. And that works out perfectly well. But if you go 25, you, you know, you can start to see it. Um, but it's trial and error. But that's just a, a, a rule of thumb sort of thing. Um, the ISO, well, that depends on the camera. And basically, you know, pretty much as high as you can go. Because with a longer exposure, that doesn't show up as much noise. And some of these cameras now are superb with dealing with noise. Um, and the crop chips are 7D and the other ones that have come along are absolutely brilliant. Um, I shoot at 3200 usually with the 6D, and I find that gives me the best result. Um, but you, I mean, some people go at 6400, some go 10,000, and do a bit of noise reduction at the end. But um, you don't want to be putting noise reduction. You know, you've got that setting for nighttime noise reduction on the camera, which takes a dark frame. Um, well, that's taking too long, so you don't want to be. You know, you don't want to use that because you want to get. If you're doing a big panoramic, you want to get it done as quickly as possible. So you, you know, I, I tend to sort of stick with 3200 on that camera. But again, it's trial and error. So you can try it with each camera and uh, see how far you can push it. Um, but as I say, with the longer exposures, they tend to handle noise very, very well. Um, well, all cameras now, particularly, really. Um, in fact, I've got a friend who's got a Fuji. I think a Fuji, or I think, uh, uh, or Pentax, I think, actually. And, and that's actually got a sensor on it that apparently has got a GPS, and that will slightly sort of um, tilt within the camera body to do a bit of rotation. And he's had exposures, I think, of up to 90 seconds on a static camera, which is quite amazing. But uh, I haven't got that one. So. <laughs> um, aperture settings, well, as I said, um, obviously the, the lens you want, if you're going to do Milky Way, you know, the wide field lens, because you're going to get more in, um, but you want as low a, a, um, as F number as you can get, obviously, to let more light in. Um, and I typically go, I've got a, the, the 50 mil I've got goes to f1.4, and I can shoot that about f2, and that's lovely, no vignetting or anything, and that's, that's the signal, it's a lovely length. But the Canon, the 24 mil, although it's f1.4, as I said, I've tried to shoot at f1.4, and that's just too too much, and, and there's a lot of vignetting. I tend to stop that down to f2.2, f2.8. So ideally, you want a, as low an um, aperture you know, as you can. Uh, my first lens was the, uh, the Rockingham, um, that's the American word, I can't remember the other, what, the Samyang, that's it, the 14mm, and that was an f2.8 manual lens, and I used to shoot that wide open with no problem at all, so that's a, that's a superb lens. Um, shutter speed, kind of covered already, really, with the 500 rule, but, um, you know, well, as I say, depending on the size of your chip, you know, and uh, the, uh, the the lens you use and all the rest of it, you've got to go by the, you know, you would go by the 500 rule, okay? Um, there's one other thing, and that's very important, and that's the focusing. Um, and people use different methods to do that, but there's, you know, there's two or three ways you can do it. You can uh, you can either do a, a picture during the daytime of a very, you know, an object very, very far away, infinity, and find the, the, the focus point there and mark your lens. But um, ideally, you know, you want to go in the field and, Focus on something bright, one of the brightest stars or the planet, if you've got Venus or something like that. Um, and what I tend to do is I'll use live view. And if you've got live view, that's usually the best way because uh, you can bring up live view, find uh, one of the brightest stars, and you can also zoom in on live view up to 10 times. So, and when you do that, you find that you just breathe on it and you can move it. it it's uh, it, you really get a good sharp focus because. Going through all that procedure and not quite having your focus right, there's nothing worse because you've ruined the whole thing, you know. So that's a very important issue. But that, that's that's the best way to do it, I've found, is to focus on something, you know, it, you know, something bright in the night, but you usually can find something. Um, and, uh, you know, zoom up on live view. 
and, and then lock the, obviously lock the lens down on that manual focus because you'll, that'll never focus anyway. But um, so that's a very, very important thing. Uh, I'll just keep me on the time. We're doing okay. Um, so without further ado, I'll go through uh, some of the, you know, pictures that I've gone through during the time. Um, and this, this is a beautiful place um, in just in Suffolk that I go to, um, one of my favourite spots. This is two or three years ago, well, about four years ago. Now, this is a, a raw frame with nothing, you know, nothing done to it at all. And you can see there's not much light pollution at all, at very low at distance sort of areas there. You can see the little sodiums as they were then. Um, but you can see the structure of the Milky Way already. I think that would have been, I think that was my 24 mil lens. Um, so that was a 20 second exposure. So without any um, processing or anything like that, you can see that, you, you know, you're getting quite a good um, Milky Way with, with using that method. Um, I went back that, to that same spot the next year, and unfortunately, they had a big um, LED light in the field about 100 yards behind me, and that was the effect of it, um, which was horrendous. And I did actually um, write to him and ask him about all this, and he explained about, you know, well, not so much astronomy. I sort of played on the thing about nocturnal wildlife. And to their credit, they did turn it out after that um, when they're not there, because there's no one around that place at all. But you can see, you know, you've, you've, what you've, got, you've lost the sky. You know, obviously, you, you know, this the same, uh, the same exposure, same camera, same lens. All of us went a year later. Um, I was shocked to see the difference. And as you can see them side by side, um, you know, you, you can see, uh, you can see part of the Milky Way. But uh, now it's probably. Although they haven't got that big spotlight, it's probably worse because of LED lights because you know that they're um, they're so efficient. They're pure white light, and we've been back there, and um, you can look across the horizon, and it looks sort of the sky doesn't look. It kind of looks sort of grey, you know. And when you take your picture, you realise the LED sort of throws this light up so much further um, than like uh, let's say. When we were here, because the, the sodiums, you know, you can get about five or ten degrees, and then you've got a nice sky. But I'm afraid the LEDs they, they shoot their light, you know, much further than that. So that uh, you know, really is a case of uh, getting away from light pollution, and that's one of the biggest things, especially now, is finding the spot and uh, getting as far away as you can, even though you can't see lights, you know, visually. Of course, with the camera, it sees it can gather a lot more light than the eye can, so uh, it becomes more important. Um, I say this was this is an early sort of shot, just sort of mucking around really locally, um, and that was actually at Norwich um, Astronomical Society, so that's at Seeding, which is, you know, supposedly very dark, which it, do, it does look dark, but that uh, that light that you can see around the, the clouds there is bouncing off Norwich, which is a good what 16 or 17 miles away. So um, and of course with LED now that's getting a little worse. So, um, if you look overhead, then that's pretty good. But to say with the Milky Way, you really want as much of the sky, especially down at the horizon, as you can, to be um, free of light pollution. So um, I started to sort of venture out a bit further, and uh, we got the Suffolk coastline uh, about 20 miles down the road. So I went down there, you know, about 3 a.m. because this would have been early in the year, and with a bit of processing, that's a little bit rough there. But you can definitely see more of the structure in the Milky Way when you get away um, from towns. Although you've got a very small village in the background, you look across the ocean there, um, you can still see the effect of that. Um, so I decided, uh, well, where else can I go? So uh, I found a place called Cove Hive, um, which is a few miles down the coast, and that really just looks out to the ocean across the channel. Um, but to get there, I had to take my van and put my push bike inside the van with all my camera gear because there's no access to the beach where I want to go. Um, so I did that and rode down a farmer's field at half past one in the morning with all the camera gear on my back, got to the beach, dropped it down the bike and walked a quarter mile up the beach. Um, and obviously you have to plan, as I say, with the, um, you know, your planetarium, with your, you know, your uh, uh, the phone, the phone app that I was showing you. Um, but also things like the tide. Uh, and uh, the, you know the moon rise and moon set and astronomical darkness. Now I was walking up the beach to this particular spot, thinking I'm not right in the head. I'm sure I'm not, but um, because I could hear the waves, but I couldn't see them at all. I had my little head torch. But when I got there, um, that that was one of the best ones at the time that I got, and I just sort of plopped it all down there and got the setting right before I went. And um, you can see that, that that you know with a bit of process, and there, there's a lot of structure then going down to the horizon. 
there's a very, very faint little bit of um, light pollution coming from right over on the continent, probably. But um, it, it's, a, it's a huge difference. And that was one of the darkest times, you know, at that time, that was the darkest sky I've probably seen. And it was phenomenal. Um, but it took a lot of effort to get there and back. Um, and as I uh, finished up, I could hear the waves um, crashing a bit lower, which was a bit worrying, but I knew what the tide was like. And I told that to a fisherman and he said, well, that's nothing. He said, when you can hear the waves and feel it on your feet is when you've got to worry. But uh, not as bad as that. Um, I haven't said anything about panoramics. Um, there's a lot to say about it in not a lot of time, but basically I, I sort of moved on to, to doing, you know, bigger panoramics. Um, and some of the ones I do now can be up to 40 panels um, to get the whole thing in. Because during spring, you know, as you know, the Milky Way is coming up um, in the early hours and that's quite low in the sky. And that's a nice time to have a go at it because you don't quite need as many um, uh, you know, images in your panoramic to get it all in. Um, so, but during the, the, as the summer progresses and then astronomical darkness gets back at uh, August, September, the Milky Way has risen a huge amount and uh, astronomical darkness around about 11, half 11. And it's already coming up from the south and it's going right overhead. So you've got to do a massive panoramic. But I tend to do mine vertically. Some people do it horizontally, but my tripod doesn't like that too much. So I, I do mine horizontally and I, I generally do four rows, you know, like four rows of 10. Now you need to overlap quite a bit because you will get some vignetting and you've got to give the thing, you know, like I use auto panel to stitch the pictures, which is brilliant. There are other things like PTQ and I think Microsoft do a free one called Microsoft Ice. And that's supposed to be okay, but you need to overlap them quite a bit um, to, to eliminate the sort of vignetting and to give it something to, you know, to see, to actually stitch together. Um, so I, as I say, I tend to, I've got a, a sort of locked head uh, on my tripod. It's all dead simple. When I'll get my first picture, I'll be right at the end where, where the Milky Way is coming up, but I'll, I'll go further than I have to because you often find you've got to crop out quite a bit. Um, and I'll take my first image, say 20 seconds with a, with a 24 lens, and as soon as that picture is finished and that's downloaded, I'm cranking the thing around, uh, you know, to do it as quickly as possible. Because um, even a 40 panel mosaic, you know, you're talking 20 minutes. Well, it's quite a bit of movement in the sky during that time. So you want to have all these settings, you know, right before you really get there. You want to know what you're doing so that you can do it as quickly as possible. Anyway, um, so one of my first early panoramics uh, was from, again, the place where I go in Suffolk, um, which is a lovely then dark site. That was an early panoramic, um, probably, I think that would have been about 16, 16, two rows of eight, something like that. So it was during the spring, I think it was about April time. And you might be able to see in the shadow there, there's me and my wife sort of gawking up at the sky. Um, she never usually comes to me, but she did this night. And I'm sort of focused on taking pictures of the Milky Way. And she's saying, I can hear something, I can hear animals, I can hear this. And I'm going, no, 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 you can't hear anything because I'm focused on what I'm doing. And she kept saying, I can hear things, I can hear things. Um, and I was saying, well, just hang on a minute. And um, at the end of the exposure, I said, I'll, I'll have a look when we finish the exposure. And I heard a little grunt of something. It was pitch black. Um, and as the exposure finished, I sort of shone the torch out the front. And right in front of us was six cows stood there looking at us chewing grass. Well, she jumped out of her skin and she hadn't been since. So <laughs> but, uh, you get, you're getting some funny situations doing this sort of thing. But as I say, planning is all important, you know. Um, going a bit further, um, this is one of the, First of the better ones that I got, which was a uh, Haysborough Lighthouse. Um, and that was, uh, I think that was a 16 pound mosaic, and that's in early April. So it would have been, you know, sort of this time of year, really. Um, and that's at the optimum time, which was about 3 30 a.m., when it just clears the, the lighthouse. And something like that to have in your picture is, is just great, you know, a nice lighthouse to just sound beneath the Milky Way. And again, this was with an old Sam Yang 14mm lens. So they, I think these were 30 second exposures, um, two rows of eight. And um, over, over here, I thought, I mean, this is just um, a small campsite with a few then sodium lights. I would think now if they got LEDs, you'd get nothing like that kind of structure. I mean, you can kind of, you can process and sort of get it down, but what you can't do is you can't, you can't get what that sort of, um, you know, where that light, you won't get the faint Milky Way stuff, you know, once that's on, because obviously the magnitude of that is far, brighter than the Milky Way behind it. But that was one of the, with the planning and, um, you know, going out there in the field, doing it as soon as possible, um, you can start to do. Um, there weren't, I mean, that weren't lit uh, specifically, but of course with the camera, there's often stray light around somewhere and you'll be surprised at the amount of detail that you can pull out. 
Some people use uh, what, you know, what we call a light cube to light the foreground. Um, I don't like, I personally don't like it too light. I, I like it to look a bit more like nighttime, you know. Um, some people like it quite light, and uh, it, uh, for me, that's not not what I like. I like to know that, you know, it's something at night time. You can pull, as I say, you'll pull a bit of detail, it's just enough to see. Um, and then you can see Andromeda. There's, all, there's often sort of a slight uh, roar is going on, this and the other. We're going further afield because, uh, you know, I wanted to sort of, I wanted to travel around and get, you know, as, as good a Milky Way as I could get, but get away from all the lights and, you know, try and get up to see if I can see Sagittarius and get to a little bit of lovely horizon. Um, during, I think, I, October a few years ago, we went to the Isle of Mull, and at that point, that was about the darkest place I've been to. Um, that was quite a big panoramic, but um, you can see, yeah, I mean, you can see nothing down there, no, nothing in the way of uh, light pollution at all. Um, so that gives you a really good um, uh, go at getting the Milky Way. And what I was lucky this time, because over to the north, there was a there was aurora going off, um, and the only bit of light pollution there was just Mogan or Ubang, what you call it. Which is a good what 30 miles or so over that way, so it just shows you what what uh, what happens to light pollution. But at that time, this was the the best um, the best place I've been. Very very dark skies, very little light pollution uh, uh, whatsoever. Uh, one of the best places, um, and I mean uh, I've been, was in Devon, and I'll, I'll show you later. I went there very recently, um, and there's a place called Start Point, and that's right off the south coast there near Knightsbridge um, uh, and Dartmouth. And um, because the Milky Way is coming up south, you know, south, southwest and that kind of part, you're looking directly across the Atlantic Ocean. And because you're as far south as you can get, you know, you're seeing a, you know, a few degrees more of the Milky Way. Um, and that's really as good as you can do, I mean, in this country. So um, by, by, by using that method, I went to, to there and um, this was one of the pictures I got from there. Now, that shows you how much more you can get in if you've got a truly dark sky. Now, this was very early September, and um, that I happened to walk past there. There's a car park to the right, and as I was coming back, I, I just see this popping up in this little valley there, and I had to stop and pitch that, um, because it's pitch black. Let's look straight across the Atlantic, no lights for 3,000 miles. So, um, you know, and I really didn't have to do that much processing or whatever to, to pull that out. And you can see a little bit of the grass is lit up there, so it's very nice because um, the thing with this hobby and going to strange places and you know out of the way car parks is you sometimes bump into people with let's say different hobbies, um, which happened on this night. Um, and I knew there was a couple of cars in a car park, so anyway I went and got my pictures and I had a big high vis jacket on, my red torch, my camera, and I plopped the camera down there and started clicking away. And I think these people in these cars must have heard me. And they came to explore, and they, they, they used their torch to light that there. And I thought, oh, that's nice, they lit the grass on me. And as they turned around to see who was there, I stood up and went, hello. And uh, I've never seen people run away so quickly when they saw me there with a the camera. So uh, I don't know who they thought I was. But um, that's some of the things you actually can bump into on your journey. So, you know, just to be prepared. Um, one of the other uh, good places I've been was Durdle Door on the south coast at uh, Dorset. And, um, this one, as I say, using, I mean, I've never been to these places before, but using that TPE on my uh, on the phone um, and looking at the satellite imagery, you can drop it right down to ground level and you can tilt it as if you're looking across. Um, so you can see what angle you're going to get. And then if you combine that with the planetarium, you know, for the same location at the same time, you can time that exactly what you want, as, in, as you can with the moon and the uh, sunrises and what have you. And that's exactly what I did with this. So I knew, I think this was the 5th of August, so I knew at that time that this was going to be uh, the prime sort of time and you know spot to get that Milky Way rising above there, and that was the first shot of the evening. And um, obviously, there's there's a it looks it's quite well lit, but there is very very distant light. But as I say, with the camera with 20 second exposure, which this was, it's amazing how much light you can pull out. So I, I didn't use any uh, light cube or additional lighting at all. Uh, another panoramic. That's that at the time, to my mind, this was the best place I've ever seen, you know, in the country. And that, again, that was start point, but that's a bit a bigger panoramic, which is further down. Um, and that was in September, although I didn't get the whole of the Milky Way at that time. Um, that was a few years ago. But that was an astonishing sky. And you can see, as I say, you can look right to the horizon over on the south there, where um, Sagittarius is, and there's not a hint of light pollution. You can see the detail you can get there. Okay. Now, 
a couple, two years ago almost, we were very lucky, me and my missus, and we uh, booked in uh, two weeks to go to New Zealand, the South Island. Um, and I very, very carefully planned um, using those apps and what have you, exactly where I want to go, where I want to be, at what time, and all the rest of it. And um, I picked the time of the year when the moon was out of the way, um, which well, I, my wife said, are you planning this around astronomy? I went, no, 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 no. And um, so I did. Uh, we had a new moon on this particular night. And I got as far south as I could, which I think was 44 degrees south from a place called Hooper's Inlet. And New Zealand skies it was, uh, were amazing. And using the techniques that I've been using, you know, I knew where I wanted to get. I knew what time I wanted to get there. I knew the settings, everything else. So that allowed me to go there and get that 40 panel mosaic, you know, just in like in an hour, you know. So, uh, and as you can see, I mean, you know, with those techniques, um, and that kind of you know 20 second exposure what you can really get um and so in total that was about 20 25 minutes worth but i think the first 10 minutes i just stood there with my mouth open because the sky was phenomenal you've just got a minute left, a bit of planning. Got a minute left sean are we getting near the end yeah we've just got a minute left less than a okay, minute mate. all right okay well any questions that there's just a couple there from uh Hi. <laughs> Let's just get my head. Come on, there. Questions, anybody? Kyle. Right. So, thank you. Question from my ignorance, if we can. <laughs> All right. What? Well, let me get my head. Let me get my headphone in, and we'll take the question as quickly as we can. Yeah. Kyle. Question. You said the 500 rule. Yes. Divided by the focal length of the of the lens. Exactly. Um, I, I've, I've got one of these nifty 50 mils. How do I how do I find the focal oh. length of that? You've you've got a 50 mil, did you say? Yeah. Well, that is your focal length. You've got. A